Hi hey everyone, I'm Gordon Raquel at Filmmaker U. At Filmmaker U, we create courses for film professionals to deepen and diversify your existing skill set. You can subscribe at filmmakeru.com. Uh, every week we go live at 2 p.m. with a film professional to chat and give you a chance to join us and ask questions. Today I'm joined with Steve Bodecker, sound designer for Black Panther, Star Wars, The Clone Wars, Tron Legacy, and so, so much more. Hi Steve, welcome to the show. Howdy. I do want to ask you about Tron Legacy because that is one of my favorite films for sound. <laughs> and it's this weird balance between music and the sound design itself. So how did, what was your working relationship with um, the music department and developing that sound for the film? Well, I think uh, the biggest part of it was once it was solid that it was going to be Daft Punk, that kind of set the course. You know, um, there's so many different kind of futuristic type musics that you could go along with. It was obviously going to be electronic, but once it was Daft Punk, that was like, okay, I get where we're headed. I had the privilege of being involved in an early pre trailer for the movie before it was greenlit, and it was a test to see how it would work. And um, I was able to do all of the work for that. I did, you know, all the sound design and all the editing and everything like that in my studio here in San Francisco and um, just did a bunch of back and forth with the director and then that got presented to the studio and the studio got excited. So we were very lucky to have um, uh, positive momentum before the film even started shooting, to be honest. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was, it, was, it was such a fun, crazy, weird um, project to be a part of. What, what made it so weird? Is it? Um, weird just because it's, it's strange. Well, it's always a pleasure to be involved in something before it's been shot. Um, we try whenever possible to be doing that. But also, um, it hadn't been shot, and then it was all the CG that was happening all along the way. So it was actually a very long process with a lot of kind of iterations and evolution along the way. Um, and, you know, it even got to the point where it was like we were getting towards the end. Some of the studio people were saying, you know, what, what happened to the sounds from the previs and it's like oh everybody got kind of bored with those but they weren't and so when we went back and revisited some of those and sort of cherry picked some of the stuff that was fun from that um but yeah it was cool well, you, were, you were saying things were changing as you went so what were was there anything that changed that you were like oh, i wished that could have stayed in but it had to be moved or just this got cut from the editorial room not so much that kind of thing i think it's like I said, there was just this positive, this huge momentum, and then you have these massive stalls. So it's like there was momentum to get the first trailer going and then you stall, and then you start up again once it's been shot, and then you stall because there's all kinds of visual effects. And so what happens oftentimes when you do that is you start redoing things that you already had done that you like. I'm a huge proponent, I'm a musician as well, so I'm a huge proponent of like, record your demos, <laughs> get those initial ideas down, because more often than not, some of those initial ideas are the seeds of something that was really amazing. But if you get bored with those things because you've had so much time all along the way, um, uh, you have to sort of step back and kind of recalibrate yourself to where you were when you first started. Now, you, you work at Skywalker Ranch. How did you get involved in that space? So it's a it's a, an interesting story actually. I was working before that at uh, what was Digidesign, so where Pro Tools was made, and before that I was working with sampling keyboards, doing sample libraries, and through both of those jobs I was able to meet this guy Ren Kleiss, who was doing music at the time, and he had been working up at Skywalker as a sample engineer. Um, on I don't even remember it was maybe maybe a Mariah Carey or something like that. Um, and we just kind of became friends and he started doing more commercial work. And so we started kind of collaborating as I was working at DigiDesign with demos for the Pro Tools products. And um, then he started growing his company and getting more and more involved in stuff. And I said, hey, at some point, if you have more of this kind of work, I would love to be a part of it because I really loved working with the equipment, but using it was really where my heart was. And um, you know, there was back and forth and back and forth over the span of about a year. And at one point he called me, said, I don't have enough commercial work for both of us, but would you be interested in working on a movie? My friend that I've done a lot of commercials with is directing this movie. And that was seven. And so Ren and I, that was both of our first experience. And, um, uh, 
And now he's gone on just, he's like, he's amazing. He's got multiple Oscar nominations this year. And he's like the most amazing, nice, creative, passionate person you will ever be in a room with. You don't even have to talk to him. But um, uh, through that, I became more associated and, and involved with a lot of the Bay Area film community. And of course, Skywalker is like a huge part of that stuff. We were at Saul's Ants. And then I started working at Skywalker. And I got very lucky to have connected with Randy Tom. And so I worked with him for years. And through him, got to know more and more of the people out at Skywalker and got more and more of my own opportunities. Um, and then since then, I've worked in New York. I work in, I work in New York a lot. I worked in LA, obviously, a lot. I spent the better part of a couple of years in London working when they were really, really starting to get their post-production um, momentum. Now they're, they're huge and there's just so much talent there. So the cool thing about this job is that you really can work with a lot of great people in a lot of great cities. And post-production tends to be in the hubs of some of the coolest cities in the world. So if you have the opportunity and you have the ability to, to work in other places, those things you know, I worked in New Zealand too. So yeah. Well, I was gonna I, say in, in London, were you in the Soho? Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I had a flat. I had a flat in Covent Garden. Yeah. That it costs more than they were giving me, but it was so dope. I had to. I had to get it. And the crazy thing. So this is a side thing, but the crazy thing. This this place was so great, and I was there, and it was snowing and all this stuff. But my my lease was longer than I was gonna be there. And Randy Tom was coming over to do some work. And so he took over the place when I was leaving, which was just at the beginning of the summer. But this place didn't have air condition. So it was amazing for me in the wintertime. And then in the summer, he was having to open the windows. And it was like four stories above a really busy pub. And he said <laughs> it was hot. It was loud. It was miserable. And I'm like, you're kidding. It was amazing. <laughs> That's so, cause I remember being in the Soho area for stuff and it was just like, as soon as four o'clock hits, it's just yeah. noisy and yeah. everyone's yeah. hanging. And I was, I was shocked because, um, you know, I got to meet a lot of people while I was there, but I kept running into people that I knew from here. And it's yeah. just because a lot of it goes through there. I worked in Pinewood as well, which was really fun. But even when I was working in Pinewood, I was staying in Soho and you just be walking down the street and you just bump into someone that, you know, from back home or um you know someone that you met while you were there it's um the energy is just oh, different. Awesome. but almost all post-production places the energy is amazing now so how do you like to approach um working with the director when it comes to sound design um because you've worked with some amazing directors so how do you sort of get on the same page as, as them to make sure that it sounds the way they want um one thing i try to do if i can and I've tended to do is work with directors that are also writers. Um, and the reason for that is that their thinking and their creativity tends to be grounded in a real world and an idea and a little bit more confident because they're not trying to please someone else's idea or some script that had been floating from this studio to that studio to another studio. Now that doesn't mean that you can't have like a great time doing that. But part, a huge part of my job is to get in the brain of the director, figure out what it is that is their aesthetic and what style they're into. It's kind of like once I knew that Daft Punk was doing Tron, I knew what they were doing and where they were after. And then I kind of absorbed that and make that my aesthetic. Um, when you're working with committee, it gets really crazy, you know? And there are times where you've nailed it for the director and someone else doesn't know exactly what they want and um so i i usually whenever possible i try to work with someone who has that they also have like um they have a tendency to more be more open to new ideas hmm. believe it or not it might sound counterintuitive intuitive that someone who wrote the script would be open to a new idea but it tends that if your idea works for their story and the emotion that they were going for when they wrote it they usually will embrace it and just totally roll with it. Um, so like when I'm working, like Ryan Coogler is absolutely that way, ultimately. So is JC Chandor. Um, Tim Burton, even though he doesn't necessarily write stuff, he has such an aesthetic. He is hired to be that 
creative <laughs> brain. Yeah, nobody's going to question him, you know. Yeah. So um, anyway, I don't know if I even answered your question, but there you go. Well, you, you did. And it's what's interesting is I wonder if it's because they're writers and there's so much in their head and you're alone with your script. And then to have someone be like, well, here's an, here's an idea potentially. And, but, you know, cause a lot of it's protecting it from the studio or protecting it from these things. And all of a sudden they have a creative person to work with. I wonder if it's something like that. Yeah. And I think they, 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 I think they often can recognize when someone's just passionately trying to work with them to get their ideas out. Um, I was actually just talking to someone earlier today because I get asked all the time, can you watch a movie without just picking it apart? Is it, it, our movies just lost on you. And mm -hmm. it's absolutely the opposite because a huge part of my job is to just bury myself in what I'm working on and try to shut everything down. I've got my studio in here, it's my world. And I come in here and I bury myself in the movies. And I, I, when I'm able to do that, I can recognize the sounds that need to be there. They, they come to me, you know? Um, so, um, now I forgot where I was going with that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no. I was telling him. So, so if I go to a movie and I'm not able to do that, then something's wrong. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, there you go. So, you know, you talked about people having vision and you've, you got to work on Black Panther, which has Paul Feig as the visionary of that whole, the architect of the whole mm -hmm. Marvel Universe <clears throat> what was that like was there like how do you sort of come into an environment that's already been designed in a sense and what I mean is that you know there's sort of uh, like if you see Captain America in one they've got a sound library built on him to do this in this case you were lucky to build you, you got to build Black Panthers but what what was Marvel wanting in terms of how it sounded like how how do you get on that page? So they were they were um, amazing at letting Ryan Coogler be Ryan. I just we just had a Zoom with him yesterday, and um, he is he is such a um, I'm not blowing smoke either. If you ask anybody else who worked on, it, he's such an amazing talent, and he just exudes this creativity. And they are smart enough in Marvel to recognize that when they've got it. And so they gave him all kinds of creative control and latitude. Uh, but I will say they really are smart the way they have things set up um, with their like, executives, but they're more just creatives. They are responsible for different aspects of the filmmaking process. So you have one executive is a huge background in visual effects and her notes tended towards sound effects related things, any sound effects that could help the visual effects come more alive, that kind of thing. Um, another producer was very much into story. Kevin Feige is much into making sure everything fits within the Marvel universe. Um, so they're really good at kind of covering all these different bases and then making sure that they talk to Ryan about how it fits with his story. Again, he wrote it uh, with Joe Robert Cole. So he knew what he was trying to convey and what, um, emotions he was going for and what story outside of the Marvel universe he was trying to tell. So, um, it was, it was nothing but fun to be honest. Yeah. That's very a nervous and anxious fun. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, that's a really smart way to sort of compartmentalize your executives into like a focus like that. And yeah. Um, and you know what else they did? They, they, they told us early on, they have this thing. They said, if you hear any of us say, I'll take it to my island, that, you know, it's, <laughs> that meant that, that, that they had something that they were passionate about, but nobody else was on board and they'll like, okay, fine. So you it know. doesn't mean that they have an island. <laughs> they're, they're like, I'm going well, on vacation this weekend. At I'll this point, with they, to the island. Each, <laughs> they, might, they might each have down payments on them at this point. Yeah. yeah. Um, what, what were some of the challenges in, in Black Panther in, in bringing that to life? Um, you know, uh, I was actually just talking with someone about this the other day. One of the biggest challenges was figuring out um, the technology, the ships, you know, the technology of the devices that they're using, the weapons, all that stuff. Um, because Ryan really was passionate about Wakanda being a stealthy place 
but super, super advanced technologically. And, you know, if we look around at the technology that we're used to, and so many things that we use today used to make all kinds of crazy sounds. And uh, one of the examples that we kept talking about is phones. You know, people get a phone and you get it and it makes all this racket. And you're like, turn those clicks off and turn this off and turn that off. Um, and so there was all this talk about the technology being very stealthy and almost silent. And it was difficult because you also are making a Marvel movie and it needs to be fun and it needs to be energized and it needs to be exciting. And so what we were doing is we were finding sort of science-based ideas for how we could justify some of the things that we wanted to do. And the ships, for example, the RTFs are a great example because we talked about wanting them to be very, very smooth and stealthy and quiet. Um, and it's not that exciting. <laughs> for one, <laughs> but also it doesn't help out that producer who wants to make sure that the visual effects are as believable as possible. And our kind of overly thought about justification was that what if these ships were propelled by sound? And so the sound was actually mostly existing in the back. And so as these things are approaching you, they're pretty quiet. The sound that you would hear potentially if you could hear anything would be its interaction with the world, the sounds of the the waves and the pressure against the ship itself, something that you can't avoid by having a mass travel through air. Mm -hmm. uh, but as it passes, all of a sudden it would make this crazy amount of sound. And uh, Benny Burt, who co-supervised with me, he had recorded a, one of those rocket cars, you know, that they fly out or that they drive out on the salt flats to try to do land speed records and whatever. And one of the things we noticed with that is it's not just a sonic boom, it had this weird twangy, crazy sound to it. Um, that was amazing, but it was doing exactly what we talked about. And we put some of that sound in some of the ship buys, but that kind of became our mental justification. So we were always kind of having these, you know, balancing between sort of what was the science and, and the technology of Wakanda, but also how are we gonna keep this thing exciting? And how would you do that? Like, cause I think about uh, in the editing process, whenever I'm working, it's like, you know, okay, well, here's the green screen maybe put some bad temp VFX in, you know, sometimes it'll just be a shot, like a placeholder card or something. So how do you uh, determine what something's going to sound like if you don't even have a visual uh, in the edit? We actually, we were really, really lucky. And I know some of the other people who work on Marvel movies were very jealous of the situation <laughs> we found ourselves in with. And I'll tell you why, because uh, Ludwig, Gornson, the composer, and Ryan went to school together. They've been, they've been partners and creatively sharing the same musical minds for years and years and years and years. And um, Ryan respects Ludwig's work process and Ludwig writes for a scene. And so if you make changes to the scene, he rewrites and it drives some people crazy. Some of the like post-production people were just going nuts. It's like, you've got to just write it and we'll edit it, we'll make it work. It's like, no, 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 I write. And Ryan really respected that that was the way that he worked. And so he would tend to work through a scene and get it working the way he wanted it to, and then set it way, way, way more than any other Marvel movie. So uh, we didn't have to deal with nearly as much kind of weird tempy stuff. Um, yeah as a lot of them. Uh, but what tends to happen actually in most cases is that you overdo it, you know? Um, you're overcompensating for the fact that the visuals aren't totally together. This happens with animation as well. You, you want something to be believable. You put yourself in that world and what is it about this that I'm not buying? And you keep adding things and adding things. And then when it comes time to final mix and you're getting those final visual shots and you're like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. This ship flying by is beautiful and it feels like it's right there and I can touch it. You just start taking stuff away. Now I have a question here from someone watching and they want to know, uh, does your creative creativity for the sound uh, initially come from the script or by watching the first cut? Ooh, um, th there is a little bit of both, which sounds like a little bit of a cop out, but um, to me, I find that there's sort of two kinds of creativity when you're working on these types of things. There's the proactive where you could read a script and you could think about what you want it to sound like. And then there's the sort of reactive creativity where you see something and you go, oh my gosh, this is obviously what it should sound like. Um, and 
strangely enough, my studio at Skywalker is completely Spartan and clean. And it's where I try to be in my um, movie theater mode. So uh, mixing and, and finalizing things. And this studio in my house is much different. There's stuff everywhere. And so this is where I like to do the kind of reactionary kind of thing where um, you get an idea and you grab a prop and you record it and you try it all out. So uh, I do like to get the script, like I got the script for Black Panther. For me, it's more about trying to communicate with the director and the editor and anybody else about possible ideas where sound can help them either out of a difficult situation or help in a way like even something as simple as one of these RTFs flying by. I had talked to the editor and said, you know, if you, let the, if the ship is flying at you and you immediately cut to the reverse of it going away, it totally is disruptive to the flow of the sound. And if you can let the ship go by out of screen, I know you won't be seeing it and it seems like it's a letdown, but that huge sound of it going by will be so satisfying emotionally. And then you can cut to it going away and it'll be completely different experience. Um, so that's my, that's where my brain's at a little bit more when I'm reading a script. Do you, do you actually make notes in the script as well? Like, do you, I do. Yeah. Yeah. What, yeah. What, yeah. What do you look for in it that you're, you're making notes about? Um, it's usually just kind of ideas that pop into my head that I don't want to forget. Um, oftentimes it'll be a sound that I have that I've recorded in the past or that I've heard, um, or that I want to try to record. Um, because so much of what we do is finding sounds that have nothing to do with what you actually see that will work in an emotional and a storytelling way to um, elevate the scene. And so if I get an idea, it's like, oh, you know, it'd be really cool for this. You know, it's kind of like that rocket car thing. Benny, mm -hmm. we were working on those RTF ships flying and he's like, you know, it reminds me of this rocket car. I'm gonna see if I can find it. And he found that recording. And that really was the seeds of this whole idea for the, the ship's going by but um yeah i will scribble sometimes it's like <laughs> you know call the dialogue editor about this scene we might want to you know figure out how to do it or whatever yeah. what uh now you've also worked on documentaries yep and what would you say are some of the challenges that people don't realize uh when you're doing sound for documentaries um to, to, in my mind, there's sort of two different types. There's the type of documentary where you're really, really trying to just have the sound be as true to the actual events that are happening. Um, and then there's documentaries where people want to just kind of educate people and you can flourish them with all kinds of extra stuff. So um, the challenge to me is just sort of figuring out where the director's brain is with regards to that. Um, if they're very precious about purity and the reality of what it is that you're doing, that's one thing. If they really want to add additional emotion and things like that to the story that they're trying to tell, and it's not so much about documenting the sound, that's a very different experience. Um, I did this movie recently, well, a year ago, it's pandemic, it seems like it was a month ago, <laughs> um, called The Dissident about the Jamal Khashoggi. And that one, the director's idea, he was very clear about it up front. He wanted it to be cinematic. He wanted it to, have the energy I'm trying not to misspeak because you want the energy of an action movie but the respect for the subject matter uh, which ended up being really the biggest challenge on that one because you have these scenes that are looking like visual effects are looking really intense and you want to do the same thing with sound but we are talking about someone who is horribly murdered <laughs> and so yeah. um I think that with, with documentaries, at least to me, it's just where is too far. And is there a sense of like, what, like, do you feel there's, you can still, you know, go beyond uh, what the real sound was in the sense of like, you know, in Black Panther, you can have that rocket car because we're, we're making this a cinematic event. But if you're doing something, you know, that you don't can't really get the sound of are you comfortable or is there a you know flexibility in that yeah there's um there's a lot of interesting things you can do like that i did a i was kind of a um 
forget what they called it, but we did this, this Sundance lab where filmmakers came. Traditionally, they would come to Skywalker to do it. This time it was all online. But yeah. one of the filmmakers was doing, um, uh, talking about these various theaters that they had shot in and they wanted to have, we discussed having the sound of shows that happened in that theater. And so that's like a very different kind of abstraction to what was literally happening on the screen. Um, I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> well, I was thinking more along the lines of like, you know, in a movie, if like, and this is an old sort of thing, but you know, to do a broken arm, you're not going to break someone's arm. You're going to just break some celery or something that sounds like it. Right. Um, and I was wondering if there, since documentaries, you're trying to maintain realism, right? For and truth, uh, is there a flexibility on that? Yeah. I, again, it depends on what the goal of the documentary is. If the documentary is to show and hear mm -hmm. literal specific sounds from that time and that place then you want to be as true to those things as possible obviously anything that sort of takes you out is a bad call so um, you know having documentary footage of someone breaking their arm and then putting celery break in there would be like whoa this is just way over the top but um it is a little bit tricky trying to find that so more often than not you're being asked to take things out yeah so now is there a um scene or a movie in your career that you're most proud of in terms of the sound design? Um, wow. Um, oddly enough, it would probably be two, two very different movies. Black Panther, I really just enjoyed the process so much. I love the movie. Um, um, I love the message um, and I love working with Ryan Coogler. Uh, and our crew is just awesome. So it was just the experience. It, they tend to be experiences more than the actual movie itself. But that one, the movie it was also great. Um, Seven was fantastic to work on because, um, you know, Ren hadn't done a movie before. I hadn't even done a commercial. I hadn't done anything before. So everything was brand new. And so we weren't being told what we couldn't do. And so we did it. So that experience has stuck with me all along. You know, if we got to a scene, like there's the lust scene when they go down into that sort of dungeon thing. Um, Ren and I did the music for that in my apartment. <laughs> it stayed, you know, the opening montage Nine Inch Nails music was because I had that CD in my car and I was like, oh, this would be cool. And we put it in and it just stayed. So um, that experience was fantastic because it didn't know what we weren't really supposed to be doing. Um, as far as like a movie, All is Lost, which is Robert Redford alone on a mm -hmm. sailboat in the middle of nowhere trying to survive, was just in a fantastic experience. Um, I love the filmmakers that are all incredible, but um, also being given a story that has three lines of dialogue and minimal amount of music, um, not to mention the fact that all of the sound, the production sound was almost all unusable because they, shot it in the tank down in Mexico, yeah. Titanic was done. So yeah, there's different kinds of things that you enjoy. Being in Soho in London is always fantastic. So Carol in the Chocolate Factory was great. Yeah. Um, I have one last question that I'd like to ask everyone I interviewed. Yeah. Now, we've been in this pandemic for a year and a lot of people have been watching streaming shows and catching up on shows because they have not allowed to go anywhere. Um, is there a show or a movie you caught during the pandemic that you would recommend to people? Oh boy. Um, and the only reason I say, oh boy, is I haven't watched a lot. Crazy as it sounds. Um, my studio is right here and right next door is our sort of fun room where we have a projector. And it used to be my studio in there. It's a big room with the projector and all that stuff. Um, you know what, actually probably, we watched Soul as a family, mm -hmm. and it was movie. fantastic, you know. It's a, um, it's a great movie. The Again, it comes down to me. It comes down to so much of the experience. It was just the four of us just sitting there together with popcorn. We did the whole deal. So um, that was that was a big big one for me. If you haven't seen I'm sure everybody's seen that at this point. <laughs> no, it's funny because I my uh, at the time, my three-year-old daughter watched it with us. 
and I was expecting there's some scenes where I was like she's gonna be terrified <laughs> um, but she loved it so you know what's crazy is that so I used to um, I used to tell people that you know sometimes directors and producers will think you can just take any sound designer and splat them on any project and they will totally nail it hmm. um, but composers or, or sound designers often are a lot like composers. They have certain things that they gravitate towards, you know, um, some are much more musical and some are really, really meticulous and technical or whatever. And so I used to joke that, that uh, think of sound designers as composers, you know, you wouldn't hire Trent Reznor to do a Disney movie. Well, now with Soul, yeah. they did. And um, <laughs> I was really lucky because when we watched it, I forgot that he had done the music. And so I was able to experience it without any of that kind of, I, I was able to immerse myself in the music without thinking about it. Yeah. You know, I thought a little bit about Ren's work, which is always fantastic, but I wasn't thinking about it. It's just, yeah, it was a great experience. Yeah, well, and it's it's amazing how well he sort of transitioned into a um, composer for films. Like yes. It's been amazing. Yeah, I read an article at one point where he was talking about on Seven when we had put that music in the opening that he had never thought that his music would ever work in a in a in a movie way and um so that was now, an so, so he can thank you when he wins his oscar <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, yeah i take complete responsibility no you know it, it's like i um uh, like amazing art like he creates yeah. you know stands on its own beautifully and when it finds a place to rest itself within you know, a film, mm -hmm. it's just another thing. But I mean, the work that he does is just, it's so incredible on its own. And so I i like to think that it was inevitable that his music was gonna become a core part of all, all any number of diff different films. And so, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I love watching and hearing what he does. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for letting me interview. Yeah, yeah, thanks so much. It's been fun. Yeah, have a, have a good weekend. Will do. All right, bye-bye. Okay.